Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and Vincent Price in The Letter. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Some stars are born to fame. Others have fame thrust upon them. Then there's a third kind, like Betty Davis. All the honors in Hollywood have come to her at one time or another. Those who judge stars by box office value place her among the leaders. Those who judge by purely artistic standards accord her the same position. She's won the Academy Award twice, and yet I doubt whether Betty has has ever been completely satisfied with one of her performances. Like most great artists, she always found some detail that, uh, that might be improved for neither the box office nor the critic judge as harshly as her own instinct. Tonight, we present Betty Davis in the letter by Somerset Maugham. She gave one of her finest performances in the Warner Brothers picture, and that was only fitting because it was in another Maugham story called Of Human Bondage, that Betty really came of age as an actress. The letter packs the drama of a lifetime into a few weeks of love and violence and death. It's a great play for a great actress. But you'll hear more than one star performance because Herbert Marshall will play opposite Betty in the same part he had in the picture. And our third star is Vincent Price, who makes his first appearance here tonight. When I was first connected with the theater, the audience which enjoyed a production like this was limited to the few hundred people who could crowd into a Broadway playhouse. You can picture the riot that'd be if tonight's stars were appearing on Broadway for one night only. But today, Lux Flakes has made it possible for 30 or 35 million people to hear the play at the same time, and every one of you has the best seat in the house. The soldier in New Guinea is in the third row center, right beside the banker who is listening from his Park Avenue apartment. And Lux Flakes is at work in both places, in millions of American homes and abroad where a steel helmet may do double duty as a wash tub. Here's the curtain now for the first act of the letter, starring Betty Davis as Leslie, Herbert Marshall as Robert Crosby, and Vincent Price as Howard Joyce. <laughs> this happened a few years ago on the Malay Peninsula in the days before the war. Just north of Singapore lay the great rubber plantations, kingdoms of commerce built by natives and white men. On this particular night in the main bungalow of one of these plantations, a light burns dimly through a shaded window. The night is hot and humid, the soft breeze heavy with the scent of flowers. A clouded moon hangs low in the sky, filtering slowly through the trees, making patterns of shimmering silver on the ground. There is deep silence. Suddenly, the door of the bungalow is flung open. <gasps> Missy, I hear a gunfire. Missy Crosby, I hear. That man, that is Mr. Hammond. Is he dead? I... I think him dead. You see him, Missy Crosby? Do you know where the new district officer lives? Yes, Missy. Send someone for him at once. Say there's been an accident and Mr. Hammond's dead. Yes, Missy. And get word to my husband. He's out somewhere on the number four plantation. Yes, Missy, I try. Leslie, where are you? Leslie, I'm here. Mr. Crosby? Yeah? I'm John Withers, the new district officer. Where's Mrs. Crosby? She locked herself in her room. She wouldn't see me until you came. Huh? Excuse me. Leslie, let me in. Leslie, darling, it's Robert. Leslie, what happened? Didn't they tell you? They said Hammond was killed. Is he... 
Is he still out there? I had your head boy remove the body to a shed. Leslie, what happened? Tell me. He tried to... to make love to me, and I shot him. Leslie. Oh, Robert, I'm so glad there, you There, darling, there. Hold me tight. I'm so frightened. There's nothing, nothing to be frightened about. It'll be all right. <gasps> now, there, now, 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 that's better. Uh, I'll try not to do that again. Mr. Withers, I hope you'll understand. I didn't want to see anyone until my husband came. Yes, of course. I understand, Mrs. Crosby. Oh, Howard, uh, come in. I got your message in Singapore. Howard, how nice of you to come. Well, naturally, I want to be here if I can help. Oh, you will help me. Us. In every way I can, as your lawyer and your friend. You're a dear. Uh, Mr. Withers, this is Mr. Howard Joyce, my attorney. How do you do? How do you do? How's Dorothy Howard? Oh, she's very well and anxious to see you. Has her sister arrived from England? Adele? Oh, yes. She came last week. Oh. Oh, here now. Uh, here now. Leslie, you better be resting. Oh, I do feel dreadfully faint. Come and lie down, darling. I'll, uh, I'll get you a drink. I'm sorry to be so tired. Nonsense. You're being very brave. How long have you been here, Mr. Withers? About an hour. One of the Crosby houseboys came to fetch me. Was Hammond dead? Oh, yes. He was just riddled with bullets. What? Well, here's the revolver. All six chambers are empty. Uh, here, you two. You better have a drink yourselves. Thanks, but I'm afraid I shouldn't. I'm on duty of a sort, you know. Well, I'll have one, Bob. You feeling any better, Leslie? Much better, thank you. Um, Mrs. Crosby, I'm afraid it's my duty to ask you some questions. Well, I think I can wait, Mr. Withers, until my wife... Oh, it's all right, Robert, really. I, I feel perfectly well now. Then suppose you tell us, Leslie, in your own words, exactly what happened. I'll try. And take your time, Mrs. Crosby. Remember, we're all friends here. You've been so patient. Well, well, as you know, Robert was spending the night at number four plantation. Oh, I never mind being alone. A planter's wife gets used to that. Oh, my I dear. had dinner rather late, and I, I started working on my lace. Oh, I don't know how long I'd been working, when suddenly I heard footsteps outside, and someone came up on the veranda and said, Good evening, can I come in? I was startled because I hadn't heard a car drive up. Who is it, I asked? Jeff Hammond. Oh, of course, I said. Come in and have a drink. Were you surprised to see him? Well, I was, rather. He hadn't been in the house for ages, had he, Robert? Three months at least. I told him Robert was over at the number four plantation getting out a, a shipment or something. Wasn't that it, darling? What did he say to that? He said, oh, I'm sorry. I felt rather lonely tonight, so I thought I'd just come over and see how you were getting on. Well, I put on my spectacles again and went on with my work. We chatted about one thing and another... He asked me if Robert had heard that a tiger had been seen on the road two or three days ago. He said he thought he'd try to get it over the weekend. Oh, yes, I know about that. Don't you remember I spoke to you about it yesterday? Did you? Oh, yes, I believe you did. Well, we, we went on chatting until... Well, well, suddenly he said something rather silly. What? It's hardly worth repeating. He paid me a little compliment. I think perhaps you'd better tell us exactly what he said, Leslie. He said, you've got very pretty eyes. It's too bad to hide them under those ugly spectacles. Has he ever said anything of the sort to you before? Oh, no, never, and I thought it impertinent. I don't wonder. Did you answer him? I said I didn't care a row of beans what he thought about me. But he only laughed and said, I'm going to tell you all the same. I think you're the prettiest thing I've ever seen. Yes, sir. Let her finish, Bob. Well, in that case, I said I can only think you half with it. He laughed again and moved his chair up closer. But, Mrs. Crosby, I wonder you didn't throw him out there and then. Well, I didn't want to make a fuss. I think a woman only makes a perfect fool of herself if, if she makes a scene every time a man pays her a compliment. When did you first suspect that Hammond was serious? The next thing he said. He looked at me straight in the face and he said, Don't you know that I'm awfully in love with you? Swine. Were you surprised? Of course I was surprised. Well, we've known him for seven years, Robert, and he's never paid me the smallest attention. Why, I didn't suppose he even knew what color my eyes were. We haven't seen very much of him the last few years. Yes, yes. Go on, Leslie. Well, he helped himself to another whiskey and soda. I began to wonder if he'd been drinking before. I wouldn't drink any more if I were you, I said. He emptied his glass and asked me in a funny, abrupt way, you think I'm talking to you like this because I'm drunk? I said that's the most obvious explanation, isn't it? Oh, it's... Awful having to tell you all this. I'm so ashamed. I wish there was some way we could spare you, Mrs. Crosby. Leslie, it's for your own good that we know the facts. All you can remember of them. Very well. I'll tell you the rest. I got up from my chair. I was standing in front of the table about, about here. He rose and stood in front of me. Good night, I said. But he just looked at me. And his eyes were all funny. I'm not going, he said. But then I began to lose my temper. 
You poor fool. Don't you know I've never loved anyone but Robert? And even if I didn't love Robert, you're the last man I should care for. He answered, Robert's away. Well, that was the last straw. Oh, I wasn't frightened, just angry. If you don't go away this minute, I told him, I'll call the boys and have you thrown out. I walked past him to call the boys, and he took hold of my arm and swung me back. Oh, I screamed as loud as I could. He flung his arms about me and began to kiss me. I struggled to tear myself away from him. Oh, he seemed like a madman. He kept talking and talking, saying he loved me. Oh, it's horrible. I can't go on. I'm very sorry, Leslie, but we'll have to know the rest. Well, he lifted me in his arms. I, I struggled to get free, but he was too strong. He started to carry me, and, and then he stumbled on those steps, and I got away from him. Suddenly, I remembered Robert's revolver in the drawer of that chest. He got up, but I reached it before he caught me. Oh, it was all instinctive. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even know I'd fired. I heard a report and saw him lurch, lurch toward the door. I followed him out to the veranda. He staggered across the porch and fell down the steps. I don't remember anything more. Just the reports, one after another, until there was a funny little click and the revolver was empty. And suddenly I looked down and saw him lying there, lying in the moonlight. It was... Only then that I knew what I'd done. My poor darling. Mrs. Crosby, may I say I think you behaved magnificently? I'm terribly sorry we had to put you to the ordeal of telling us all this. Well, you were all very kind. Quite obvious the man only got what he deserved. Withers, if you'll come with me, I'd, I'd like to see the body for a minute. Oh, yes. Yes, I'll take you to the shed. We'll only be a few minutes. My poor child. Oh, Robert, what have I done? You've done what any woman would have done in your place. Only nine-tenths of them wouldn't have had the courage. And yet I'd give almost anything if I could bring him back to life. So horrible to think that I killed him. Leslie, why, there isn't a man or a woman in the colony who won't be proud to know you. Darling, we have been happy, haven't we? You've been the best wife a man could have. I'm grateful for all the time we've been together. Oh, Robert, don't say it that way. It sounds so... so in the past. Oh, nonsense. We've got most of our lives ahead of us. Oh, if only there was something I could do to help you right now. You can love me. That's all I need. I've always loved you. Yes, but now. Leslie, darling, if I could love you any more, I would now. Robert. You have to be very indulgent towards my cooking, gentlemen. I can't vouch for it. Well, I can and will. Funny. The head boy running off tonight. Yeah, it is odd. Well, he couldn't have done any better than this, my dear. It's delicious. It certainly is. Thank you, gentlemen. I think we should start for Singapore as soon as we're finished. Right away. It's still dark, Howard. It'll be 8 o'clock by the time we get there. We'll ring the Attorney General and find out when we can see him. I think that's the first thing to do, don't you, Withers? Uh, yes, yes, I think that's the best thing to do. Would I have to be arrested? Well, you see, Mrs. Crosby, uh, as a matter of fact... I... I think you're by way of being under arrest now. It's purely a matter of form, Mrs. Crosby. Shall I be in prison? Well, that's up to the Attorney General. But it's quite possible he'll be able to accept bail. He's, he's a very good fellow. I'm, I'm sure he'll do everything he can. How do you mean, be able to accept bail? Well, my dear, it, it depends on what the charge is. What do you mean by that? I think it's not unlikely that he'll say that only one charge is possible and... In that case, well, I'm afraid that an application for bail would be useless. What, Charles? Murder. Leslie. Oh, I'm quite all right. More coffee, dear? No, no, no. no. As a matter of fact, if we're going to leave, I'd better put a few things together. I won't be long. Let me do it, Robert. No, no, no. Don't bother, dear. Oh, Leslie. Yes? There's just one question I'd like to ask you. Yes, what is it, Howard? Just before, when I was looking at Hammond's body... Oh, yes? It seemed to me that some of the shots must have been fired after he was lying on the ground. I'm afraid it sounds very cold-blooded. But I was so terrified I didn't know what I was doing. Everything was confused and blurred. Oh, well, there, Leslie, I, I shouldn't even have brought it up tonight. Put it out of your mind. Come in. Well, Uncle. Mr. Crosby to see you, sir. Oh, ask him to come in. Mr. Crosby. Thanks. Hello, Bob. Well, how, how is she? Have you seen her? If I can be of any assistance, sir, I shall remain within call. Not at the moment, Ong. Thanks. 
Hong has been a great help on the case. He finds out everything. He's the perfect confidential clerk. I tried to catch you at the house. I had to see you, Howard. You needn't hesitate about coming to the office, Bob. You know you're always welcome. How is everything? Everything's fine. In fact, Leslie's much better than you. She hasn't turned a hair. She's worth ten of me. I don't mind confessing I'm all in. The first time you've been separated for more than a day since we were married. Oh, you mustn't let yourself go to pieces, old man. I've tried to work, but it's no good. Your stake can go to blazes for all I care. I hate the house and every tree on the place. But then why not stay in town with us? Dorothy's for it, and so am I. Thanks, I think I will. I won't be so lonely. Oh, you'd better get some sleep before you see Leslie. You don't want her to have to cheer you up. She's a plucky woman. It's monstrous they should have to keep her in that filthy prison all this time. They have no choice. Anyway, it's only a week now before the trial. Well, the whole thing's a farce. Why subject her to the ordeal of a trial? Because she admitted killing a man. A trial is inevitable. She shot him as she, she would have shot a mad dog. You don't have to convince me, Robert. You know, it, it's curious Hammond was able to keep his life so hidden. That gambling house he owned, and especially the Eurasian woman. Will she be one of the witnesses? And I shan't call her. I'll just produce evidence that Hammond was married to her. He managed to keep that manager's secret, too. Oh, I know you're busy, Howard. I, I, I can't tell you how grateful I am. No nonsense. Now stop worrying. That's your lawyer's job. All right, thanks, old man. I'll, I'll see you up at the house. Yes? Mr. Joy. Well, Long? If you are not too busy, sir... May I trouble you for a few words in private conversation? No trouble at all. It has to do with the case of the Crown versus Crosby. Yes. A friend has brought me information, sir, that there is a letter from the defendant to the unfortunate victim of the tragedy. Well, that's not surprising. In the course of seven years, I have no doubt that Mrs. Crosby often had occasion to write to Mr. Hammond. But the letter, sir, was written on the day of his death. Well... You will recall that Mrs. Crosby had stated that until the fatal night, she had had no communication with the deceased for several weeks. This letter indicates that her statement is not in every respect accurate. Have you seen the letter? I have with me a copy, sir. The original is in the possession of a woman who happens to be the widow of Mr. Hammond, deceased. May I read it? Oh, certainly, sir. Of course, as I said, this is but a copy. Can you understand it, sir? Perfectly. Ong, oh, it's, it's inconceivable that Mrs. Crosby should have written such a letter. May I suggest, sir, that it would be well to make sure, since my friend is of the opinion that the letter would be of some interest to the prosecutor. I'm obliged to you, Ong. I'll give the matter my consideration. Very good, sir. Do you wish me to communicate that to my friend? It might be well if you kept in touch with him. Yes, sir. It might be very well. You may stay in the visiting room as long as you want, Mrs. Crosby. The warden's orders. That's very nice of him. Thank you. Howard, how good of you to come. I wasn't expecting you today. Good morning, Leslie. You're looking very well. Thank you, Howard. Well, the trial's only five days off now. I know. Each morning when I awake, I say to myself, one day left, just like I used to at school with the holidays coming. Oh, Leslie. Oh, don't feel sorry for me, Howard. The time has really passed quite quickly. I've read a great deal and worked on my lace. But I will confess something to you, Howard. I'm not looking forward to testifying in court. Leslie, one of the things that it's impressed me is that each time you've told your story... You've told it in exactly the same words. You've never varied a hair's breadth. And what does that suggest to your legal mind? Well, it suggests either that you have an extraordinary memory or... Or? Or that you're telling the plain, unvarnished truth. I'm afraid I have a very poor memory. Leslie, I suppose I'm right in thinking that you had no communication with Hammond for several weeks before the catastrophe. Oh, quite. I I'm positive of that. Let's see. Well, the last time we met was at a tennis party at the McFarren's. I don't think I said more than two words to him. And you hadn't written to him? Oh, no. At one time, you'd been on fairly intimate terms with him. How did it happen that you stopped asking him to anything? Well, we hadn't anything much in common. He was very popular, you know, and well, there didn't seem to be any need to shower him with invitations. Are you quite certain that was all? 
Well, I may as well tell you, we heard about his, uh, his wife. And once, just by chance, I actually saw her. Oh, well, you never mentioned that. What was she like? Horrible. Covered with gold chains and bangles and bracelets. And a face like a mask. And it was after you knew about her that you stopped having anything to do with Hammond. Yes. Leslie, I think I should tell you that there is in existence a letter in your handwriting from you to Jeff Hammond. Well, I've, I've often sent him little notes to ask him something or other. This letter asked him to come and see you because Robert was going to be away. Oh, but that's impossible. I never did anything of the kind. Here, you'd better read it for yourself. This is not my handwriting. I know that. It's said to be an exact copy of one written on the day of Hammond's death. Well, Leslie? What does it mean? That's for you to say, Leslie. I didn't write it. I swear I didn't write it. The original it. is in your handwriting. It would be useless to deny it. But it could be a forgery. It would be difficult to prove that, Leslie. It would be very easy to prove that it was genuine. Uh, well, it's, it's not dated. It might have been written years ago. Oh, if you'll, if you'll just give me a little time, I'll try to remember. Leslie, the prosecution could cross-examine your houseboys. They would soon find out whether someone took a letter to Hammond on the day of his death. I swear to you, I did not write this letter. Very well. And there's nothing further to talk about. I'll be going. Howard! Howard, wait a minute. I... I did write it. But you see, I was afraid to mention it. I thought none of you'd believe my story if I admitted that he'd come there at my invitation. Go on. You see, I was preparing a surprise for Robert's birthday. I knew he wanted a new gun, and, oh, I'm so dreadfully stupid about sporting things. I thought I'd talk to Jeff about it and get him to order it for me. Perhaps you've forgotten what's in the letter. Will you have another look at it? No, I don't want to. Then let me read it to you. Robert will be away. I absolutely must see you. I'm desperate, and if you don't come, I won't answer for the consequences. Don't drive up to the door. Leslie, I'll have to talk to you very plainly. I told Robert today that I was certain of your acquittal, and I didn't say that just to cheer him up. I don't believe the jury would have retired at all, but this letter alters the case completely. I won't tell you what I... What I personally thought when I read the letter. The duty of counsel is to defend his client, and not to convict her, even in his own mind. I don't want you to tell me anything but what is needed to save your neck. Oh. They can prove Hammond came to your house at your urgent invitation. I don't know what else they can prove, Leslie, but if the jury comes to the conclusion that you didn't kill Hammond in self-defense... I know. I know that... They're... Leslie! Matron! Matron, quickly! Yes, sir? Call the nurse. Mrs. Crosby is ill. While we wait for Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and Vincent Price to return with Mr. DeMille for Act Two of The Letter, do you remember this tune? It's a song I've always liked. Remember? Night and day, you're the one. Only you beneath the moon and under the sun. Isn't that what every woman would like to hear? And she can hear it if, if she's the charming person she's meant to be. And don't think you must be a great beauty to be charming. Think, don't you know women who aren't beautiful or even pretty? Yet their whole being draws you to them. They're warm and gay. Yes, and aren't they always very dainty? Flower, fresh and immaculate? And isn't that the picture in your mind when I speak of Lux girls? They go together, Lux and daintiness. Yes, because these gentle Lux flakes make this appealing quality so very, very easy to have. We women are busy. Oh, yes, there's so much to do these days. But all the more reason to remember Lux. It's so quick. That dainty habit of dipping under things daily in Lux. A little thing, seemingly, but a major part of charm. So let's never be too busy to use Lux Fake Flakes for undies each day. The ABC of charm is L-U-X. Then you're sure to hear from the one you want most to hear it from. Night and day, you are the one. Only you beneath the moon and under the sun. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act 
Act Two of The Letter, starring Betty Davis as Leslie, Herbert Marshall as Robert Crosby, and Vincent Price as Howard Joyce. <laughs> that split fraction of a moment before her mind slipped into blackness, Leslie Crosby realized that the letter she had written to Jeff Hammond was damning evidence, evidence enough to hang her. Now, a few minutes later, in the first aid room of the prison hospital, she leans wearily back in a chair, her eyes half closed. I'm afraid I've made rather a mess of things. I'm sorry. For Robert. Not for me. You've distrusted me from the beginning, Howard. That's neither here nor there, Leslie. Who's got the letter now? The Eurasian woman who was Hammond's wife. Oh. Howard, are you going to let me be hanged? What do you mean by that, Leslie? You could get hold of the letter. Do you think it's so easy to do away with unwelcome evidence? But surely nothing would have been said to you if the, if the owner wasn't prepared to sell it. That's quite true. But I'm not prepared to buy it. Oh, but it wouldn't be your money. Robert has saved some. I wasn't thinking of the money. I don't know if you will understand this, Leslie, but I've always thought of myself as an honest man. You're asking me to do something which is no different from suborning a witness. Do you mean to say that you can save me and you won't? What harm have I ever done you? You can't be so cruel. I want to do my best for you, Leslie. But a lawyer has a duty to his profession and to himself. I can't do what you ask. Oh, poor Robert. He doesn't deserve it. He's never hurt anyone in his life. He's so kind and simple and good. And he trusts me so. I mean everything to him, everything in the world. And this will ruin his life. Oh, I know what you're thinking. You despise me. You think he's well rid of me if they do hang it me. It isn't important what I feel about you. Do you understand? But I'm going to do what I can. Oh, how? Bob will want to know what the money's for. Will it be a very large sum? Well, I imagine this woman has a pretty shrewd idea of the letter's value. You won't have to show Robert the letter, will you? I'll do everything possible to prevent it. He'll be an important witness, and he should be as firmly convinced of your innocence as he is now. And after the trial? I'm going to try to save your life. Oh, if Robert loses his trust in me, he loses everything. It's strange that a man can live with a woman for ten years and not know the first thing about her. say your friend could be induced to part with the letter? I believe so, sir. But my friend has not got the letter, sir. The woman has it. She did not know the value of it till my friend told her. What value did he put on it? Ten thousand dollars, sir. Only ten thousand? Well, why not fifty or a hundred? For the reason, sir, that Mr. Crosby has in the bank a savings account in the amount of only ten thousand four hundred and fifty dollars. Ten thousand dollars is a good deal of money, Ong. Well, I'll speak to Mr. Crosby. Have the woman come to my office. I was about to mention, sir, she made two conditions. She insists that the money shall be brought to her. I can take you to the house whenever you are ready. What is the other condition? That Mrs. Crosby shall bring it to her personally. Why, you must be mad. Great heavens, man. Do you suppose Mrs. Crosby can just walk out of a prison cell whenever she feels like it? My friend thinks you could arrange to have her stay at your house until the trial. I believe the judge will permit it if you are responsible for her, sir. Very well. Ong, tell me something. Yes, sir. What are you getting out of this? Two thousand dollars, sir, and the satisfaction of being of service to you and our client. Well, sit down, Howard. I've taken the liberty of ordering for you. Oh, thanks. Uh, you're looking more cheerful, Bob. I feel better since this morning. I guess you're finally convinced that we have nothing to worry about. Well, as a matter of fact, Bob, something has come up. Oh, well, it's nothing very much, but I thought I'd better have a talk with you about it. Yes? Well, it, it seems Leslie wrote a letter to Hammond asking him to come to the bungalow on the night he was killed. Why, that's impossible. You heard her say she'd had no communication with him for weeks before it happened. Nevertheless, she did write the letter. She wanted his advice on something she was buying you for your birthday. Your birthday was about then, wasn't it? Yes, it was the end of April. In the excitement, she forgot the letter at the time and then later was afraid to say she'd made a mistake. But that's not like Leslie. She isn't afraid of anything. This was a pretty serious mistake. And she realized. 
Who has the letter? Hammond's widow. She threatens to turn it over to the prosecution. Well, what if she does? Leslie can explain it in court just as she explained it to you. Yes, but don't you see, it might alter things a good deal in the minds of the jury if, if Hammond came to your home by invitation. Well, what's to be done about it? I think we must get hold of that letter. I want you to authorize me to buy it. I'll do whatever you think is right. All right, buy the letter. I'll pay you back whatever it costs. Good. Now put the matter out of your mind. Oh, by the way, Leslie will be at the house tonight. I've arranged to have her released pending trial. Leslie, don't tell me that the same lace I saw you working on at the McFerrin's. How can you go so fast? Well, I hadn't anything much else to do this past month. What's it going to be? Too fine for a tablecloth, surely. It's a coverlet for our bed. Oh, Dorothy, Leslie and I have some work to do this evening. Look here, Robert. Why don't you take the girls to a picture? Well, it won't take all evening, will it, Hard? Well, there's a lot to go over. No use you three hanging around. You'd much better see a good film. Yes, go ahead, Dolly. It'll take your mind off tomorrow. I want you to. All right, then. I'll bring the car around. <laughs> Come on, Adele. I can see the legal mind is anxious to get rid of it. <laughs> good night, Leslie. Good night. Where do we have to go? The Chinese Quarter. Some sort of shop, I believe. <laughs> I've always wanted to see the Chinese Quarter. I hear it's a bit creepy. Of course, I'd have chosen other circumstances for a visit. Be flippant about your own crimes if you like, but don't be flippant about mine. Oh, I'm sorry, Howard. I didn't mean to be flippant. Really, I didn't. Oh, maybe it's my own sense of guilt. I have an unpleasant feeling that I'll have to pay the piper for what I'm doing tonight. I'm jeopardizing my whole career, and I have to rely on your discretion. Whatever else I am, I'm not ungrateful. Please forget what I said. Leslie, when did you first start doing that lace work? Oh, a few years ago. How did you happen to take it up? I wanted something to do, and it appealed to me. But it must take enormous concentration and patience. I find it soothing. You mean it uh, takes your mind off other things? Is that a legal question? You're not an ordinary client, Leslie. You've been watching me, Howard. I felt it all evening, trying to read my thoughts. I'm trying to understand you. Why? Because I'm so, so evil. That's it, isn't it? Some time ago, I saw a volcano erupt, an island south of here, Guadi. It had been dormant for years. And then suddenly the crest blew off. It was terrifying and beautiful. Fire turned the sky and the sea crimson. And three villages melted into ashes. Well, it's time we were starting. Ong Chi will be waiting for us. Come in, please, come in. This is the shop of my friend. If you will wait here, I shall return in just a moment. Well, let's not be too long about it, Ong. I will speak to the lady at once, sir. Well, they seem to have a little of everything to sell here. Yes, most of these shops do. That looks like good jade. And this dagger... See the workmanship on the ivory handle? Imagine all that on a knife. He who kills with an unworthy tool commits two crimes, one against himself. Will you follow me, please? The lady will see you now. Now, oh, where is she? You said she'd be here. She is coming, sir. Well, what is she standing there for? Ask her if she has the letter. Yes, sir. May go fung to has a ma function. Il gen no yen tri quigamo. Um how munque? Il kui quigamo. Mrs. Crosby, I regret, but the veil that you wear over your head, Mrs. Hammond requests that you remove it. Of course. Gilkui hung Nishi. Mrs. Crosby, Mrs. Hammond has a further request. She wishes you to walk over to her. Now, look here. Tell her this is enough. Howard, Howard, it's all right. I don't mind. Ne sang oi fungsum. Ne nun gim hega. Heyunga deha. What does she say? Mrs. Hammond say. 
You may have the letter if you will pick it up at half feet. Thank you. Gentlemen of the jury, uh, have you agreed upon a verdict? We have, Your Honor. The prisoner will please rise and look upon the jury. Do you find the prisoner at the bar, Leslie Crosby, guilty or not guilty? We find the defendant not guilty. And from that day on, I made a solemn vow that I wouldn't make another cocktail until Leslie was acquitted. So if these aren't up to my usual high standards, remember, I'm out of practice. Oh, Dorothy, <laughs> darling, they're wonderful. N n never been better. Robert Crosby, right now you wouldn't know what you were drinking. I guess that's right. I, I can't taste or think or feel. All I can do is keep saying to myself over and over, Leslie's safe. Darling. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, anyone planning to bathe, shower, or sponge before dinner should be getting at it. Well, a shower for me. Oh, I've laid out some things for you, Leslie. Thank you. Darling, I'm going to tidy myself up a bit. No, 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 don't go, Leslie. I shan't be a minute. Well, there's something I particularly want to talk to you about. And, Howard, I want to see you, too. I want your legal opinion. Oh, you do? Well, what's up? Well, I want to get Leslie away from here as quickly as possible. Well, I think a bit of a holiday would do you both good. No, no, I mean for good. But how could we? Well, you can't very well throw up your job. Well, I've got something in view that's much better. It's, it's, it's in Sumatra. We'd be away from everybody, and the only people around us would be Dutch. We'd start a new life. The only thing is that you'll be awfully lonely, darling, at the start. Oh, I wouldn't mind that. I'd like to go, Robert. I don't want to stay here. That settles it, then. I'll go straight ahead and we can fix things up at once. Is the money as good as here? Well, I hope it'll be better. At all events, I'll be working for myself and not for a company in London. What do you mean? Why should I go on sweating my life out for other people? This plantation belongs to a Malacca Chinese planter who's in financial difficulties, and he's willing to let it go for $30,000 if he can get the money the day after tomorrow. Well, how on earth are you going to raise $30,000, Bob? Well, I've saved about ten, and the bank is willing to let me have the balance on mortgage. Robert, darling, I, I shouldn't like you to take such a risk on my account. I'll be perfectly all right here. Really, I shall. Nonsense, darling. You just said you wanted to go. But I'm not sure it wouldn't be a mistake to run away. Everyone's been so kind, and, and they'll all help to make it easy for us. I do think the thing to do is to stick it out here. Anyhow, Bob, it's not a thing you want to rush into. Let's wait and see. Why should I wait? It's a good thing, and I don't want to lose it. Look, I've got all the papers in my briefcase. I'll go and get them, and you can see for yourself. And I have a couple of photographs of the bungalow to show Leslie. I don't want to see them. Please, Robert. Oh, now, come, darling. That's just nerves. That shows how necessary it is for you to get away. But, but Robert, Leslie, I... Leslie, darling, in this case, you must let me have my own way. I won't be a minute. Howard, what are you going to do? What can I do? Oh, don't tell him now. I can't bear any more. You heard what he said, Leslie. He wants the money at once to buy the estate. He can't. He hasn't got it. Oh, give me a little time. I'll pay it back. Leslie, I can't afford to let you have a sum like that. I've mortgaged everything I own. I was glad to advance it, but I... Where is the letter? I have it in my pocket. Oh, it will break his heart. What shall I do? I don't know, Leslie. If I tell him, he'll want to see the letter, of course. Here we are. Well, he's coming. It's up to you, Leslie. Oh, tell him. Tell him and have done with it. Mr. DeMille presents Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and Vincent Price in the final act of The Letter... In a moment. Right now, we have a special guest to tell you not about Lux Flakes, but about our boys who have been dishing it out to the Japs and taking it, too. She's Lieutenant Leda Jelinek, an Army nurse stationed at Birmingham General Hospital at Van Nuys, California. <laughs> I suppose you're quite busy these days, Lieutenant Jelinek. Yes. Many of the casualties from our Pacific campaigns come back here. Boys who've been in tough battles but they're on the road to recovery now. You know, about 97% of our wounded men live to tell the stories of their adventures. That's certainly a high percentage. Thanks to the quick treatment they get, drugs administered right on the field give a man a fighting chance even before he gets to the hospital. 
and that's why I'm here tonight. I want to say thank you to you women of America for the used fats you saved, fats that helped make many of those medicines, things like sulfur ointments, opiates, and tannic acid for burns. Your used kitchen fats are made into hundreds of military medicines we use every day. We need them desperately now, and will continue to need even more as we carry the attack to the enemy. So please, keep right on saving used fats and turning them in. The medicines they make will help bring these boys back alive. Thank you, Lieutenant Leda Jelinek. Yes, ladies, every drop of grease from your frying pan or broiler will help make more of those life-saving medicines. So put aside a tin can of any size or shape, never use glass, and pour in every drop of used fat. Don't throw out even a spoonful, no matter how burned or black or smelly it is. Just a tablespoonful a day will add up to a pound a month. And your butcher will give you two meat ration points for each pound, as well as four cents when you turn it in. Within three weeks, it will be ready to be made into life-saving drugs. Remember, your used kitchen fats may save a wounded man's life. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. After the play, we'll ask Betty Davis about a certain special hobby of hers. But now here's the curtain for the third act of The Letter. Starring Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and Vincent Price. Robert Crosby has returned to the room. His thoughts full of plans for the purchase of the new plantation. In silence, Leslie and Joyce watch Robert, who is brimming over with enthusiasm as he arranges the papers on his desk. This is really a handsome estate. We'll be stealing it for 30000 Bob, I don't like to throw cold water on your plans, but hasn't it struck you that the costs of, of well, of what we've been through will be pretty heavy? Costs? Oh, yes, the uh, legal expenses. Oh, no, I'm not going to charge you anything for my own services. But there are certain out-of-pocket expenses. Oh, that's awfully decent of you. I'm not sure I can accept that. But uh, what, is, what do these other expenses amount to? Well, the principal item is that uh, that letter of Leslie's I mentioned to you. Oh, yes, yes, I'd almost forgotten. You were going to... I had to pay a great deal of money for it. Well, if you thought it necessary, I'm not going to grouse. How much was it? $10,000. $10,000? Why, well, you must have been mad. You may be quite sure, Bob, I wouldn't have given that if I could have got it for less. But that, that's every cent I have in the world. Why didn't you let them bring the letter in and explain it to, to the jury? I didn't dare. Do you mean it was absolutely necessary to suppress it? If you wanted Leslie acquitted. But what, what was there in the letter? I told you at the time. It was very stupid of me, Robert. I, I remember now. You wrote to Hammond to ask him to come to the bungalow. Yes. You wanted to uh, get something for me, didn't you? Yes, I wanted to get you a gun. He knew all about that sort of thing, and, and you know how ignorant I am. Buying that letter was a criminal offense, wasn't it? Well, it's not the sort of thing a respectable lawyer does in the ordinary way of business. It was a criminal offense. Yes, it was. I might be disbarred for it. Then why did you do it? You of all people. What were you trying to save me from? Leslie, you knew I was buying a gun from Cameron. Why did you want to make me a present of another? Well, how should I know you were going to buy a gun? Because I told you. Well, I'd forgotten. I can't remember everything. You hadn't forgotten that. What do you mean, Robert? Why are you talking to me like this? Who has the letter now? I have. Where is it? Bob, it's not your letter or mine. I've got to pay $10,000 for that letter. I'm going to see it. Let him see it. Thank you. Robert will be away. I absolutely must see you. What does this mean? It means that I was in love with Jeff Hammond. No, you couldn't. We'd been in love for years. It's not true. I used to meet him constantly, once or twice a week. Every time we met, I hated myself for it. It was horrible. I loathed myself. I was like a person who was ill. Then came a time about a year ago when he began to change toward me. Oh, I didn't know what was the matter. I was frantic. I made scenes. I threw myself at his feet. Leslie. Then I heard about that, about that native woman. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. At last I saw her. I saw her walking in the village with those hideous spangles and that chalky face and her eyes like a cobra's eye. I couldn't give him up. I sent for him. You've read the letter. Oh, we'd always been so careful about writing before, but this time I didn't care. I hadn't seen him for ten days. He came, and I told him I knew about his marriage. Oh, at first he denied it. I was frantic. 
I don't know what I said to him. I hated him because he'd made me despise myself. I insulted him. I cursed him. At last he turned on me. He told me he was sick and tired of me. But it was true about the other woman, that she was the only one who really meant anything to him. He said he was glad I knew, because now I'd leave him alone. I knew that if he went out that door, I'd never see him again. I hardly know what happened. I seized the revolver and fired. He gave a cry, and I saw I'd hit him. I ran after him, and I fired and fired and fired until there were no more cartridges. That's what happened. And I have no excuse for myself. I don't deserve to live. How could you do this? How could you? I'm sorry, I shouldn't let myself go. I, I've got to think. Leslie. Well? He's going to forgive you. Yes. He's going to forgive me. And the fifth couple of the Prescott. Oh, yes, Robert's told me about them. Oh, you'll adore them, Leslie. Well, now, both of you get a good sleep because it'll be a late party. Good night. Good night, Dorothy. Good night. It's lucky you brought your dinner coat, Robert. You hardly fit in one of Howard. Now, let's see what else you'll need. Oh, well, how about your studs? They're, oh, they're probably still in the bureau at home. Home. Robert, it's no use, is it? We can't make it go, can we? I don't know. I'm not sure. Robert, you're so kind and so generous. You should have had the sort of wife you really deserve. Through no fault of yours, I've failed you, wrecked your life. I can't ask you to forgive me. If you love a person, you can forgive anything. But what about you? Can you go on? I'll try. I'll really try. That's not what I'm asking. I'll do everything to make you happy. Everything in my power. That isn't enough. Unless, Leslie, now, this minute, do you love me? Yes, I do. Kiss me, then. Kiss me as if... Rob. No. No, I can't. I can't. Leslie, I can't. tell me, Leslie, what is it? With all my heart, I... Still love the man I killed. Leslie? Leslie, let me in. My dear, they're all waiting for you. This is your party, you know. I'm sorry, Dorothy. I took rather long to dress. Why, Leslie, isn't that your lace work? Yes. Were you working on it just now? A little. I'm anxious to finish it. Oh, Leslie, please come downstairs. Of course, dear. In a few minutes. Very well. When did you first start doing that lace work, Leslie? I find it soothing. You mean it takes your mind off other things? I couldn't give him up. I said for him. At last he turned on me. He was sick and tired of me. She was the only one who meant anything to him. She was the only one. I hardly know what happened. I seized the revolver and fired. Fired and fired and fired until there were no more cartridges. I have no excuse for myself. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to... Who's up there? Who is it? You, I see you there. Mr. Crosby. Come here. What are you doing out there? I don't want to come. She make me come. She tell me I come here. She? Mrs. Hammond. She tell me I come here. Bring dagger. Leave it outside window. Of course. Mrs. Hammond. Dagger, Missy. She say bring dagger to you. She's here then? Yes, Mrs. Hammond on path by gate. You no go in garden, Mrs. Crosby. She kill you. She with her. That is what Dagger mean. She kill you, you go in garden. Missy, you know till police I come? Missy, you know till police I come? Dagger, evil workmanship on the ivory handle. Imagine all that on a knife. 
He who kills with an unworthy tool commits two crimes, one against himself. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to live. Leslie. Leslie. Yes? Leslie, you've got to do something about Robert. He's acting very strangely. What is it? I don't know. At first I thought he was drunk, but it's worse than that. I'll be right down. But where will you ship from, Crosby? Oh, it's near a good harbor, only five, six miles away. And I can ship my rubber for less money, or to get ahead fast. In 10, 15 years, I can live in London, travel, do anything I please. Robert, will you come with me, darling, please? Not now, darling. Maybe later. I'm telling the boys about my new plantation. Sounds like quite a place. Of course, we'll miss Singapore. Our friends are here, and we've had some mighty fine times. No English people in that part of Sumatra, only Dutch and natives. Going to be a little lonely at first, maybe, but we'll get used to it. Robert. There'll just be the two of us. But my, my wife's a good sport. Always can count on her. She's not afraid of anything. And we'll have each other. That's the important stop thing. Stop it, stop, stop it. I can't stand anymore. I can't stand it. Give me a drink. I want a drink. I don't want that. I don't want that. Where's Leslie? She ran out into the garden. The garden? Oh, I'll find her. No, let her alone. There's nothing you can do for her. You no go in garden. She kill you. You go in garden, Missy. See the workmanship on the ivory handle. She kill you. I couldn't give him up. I sent for him. Robert will be away. I absolutely must see you. I couldn't give him up. What does this mean? It means that I was in love with Jeff Hammond. That's not true. It means I was in love with Jeff Hammond. No. We'd been in love for years. Been in love for years. We'd been in love for years. Mr. Crosby, go back. Go back. Oh! You killed her. You killed her. Kui Ying say. Who is that? Don't move. The police. The police. Don't move. I will shoot. What do you do here? I do nothing. I tell her no go into garden. I tell her. This woman, she, she is dead. Kui Ying go say. In order, say Kui. She, she, she kill her. It was right she die. Leslie. 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 Our stars will return for a curtain call in just a moment. Meantime, we take you to a home, almost anywhere, and a mother who might be almost anyone. Mrs. Thompson is in her kitchen, and she's getting ready to do her dinner dishes. There, all scraped and rinsed. Now, well, that's funny. I know it was here when I did the luncheon dishes. Now, where did I put it? Not on the table. The closet. Hmm. I know I haven't used it all. A box lasts me practically a month. Well, I suppose I could use the laundry soap. But it takes forever to make suds. Besides, it's hard on my hands. Alice! Oh, Alice! Do you know what happened to the box of Lux Flakes I keep here on the drain board? Oh, well, you bring it right down this minute. I need it for the dishes. Well, do your sweater later, dear. I have to have it now. Yes, I'll have to get a box for the bathroom when I go to the store tomorrow. The man said he expected more this week. I hate to be caught without Lux. I know what those strong soaps do to my hands. Women everywhere say that once you've used Lux for dishes, you'll never want to use a strong soap again. Lux leaves hands so soft and lovely. Even if they're red and rough from using harsh soaps, just changing to gentle Lux Flakes will take away that dishpan look, make them smooth and attractive again. And Lux is thrifty. You can change dishpan hands to Lux hands 
for less than a penny a day. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. A curtain call is one of the oldest traditions in the theater. I don't believe it's, it's ever been better earned than tonight. And coming back to the footlights now are Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and Vincent Price. It's a pleasure to be back, Mr. DeMille. I'd like to thank all the people in the cast for their excellent work tonight. Now, to most of us, Betty, your, your name stands for fine artistry in the theater. But I think that when this war is over, many, many thousands of soldiers will remember you for another reason. That being the Hollywood canteen which Betty started. I've seen the canteen in action, and it's a very fine thing to be remembered for. So that we can keep the record straight, let's give mm. credit to the right people. There were really more than 6,000 who worked together in a team to make the canteen possible. I still say you coached that team, Betty. How many boys have visited the canteen, Betty? Well, I believe about a million and a half, Vincent, many of whom greatly admired Bart Marshall's work as a busboy. You know, I've, uh, I've often wondered what the fellows talk about when they wander over to the snack bar to see you or Irene Dunn or Eddie Lamar. Well, I remember one boy who paid me a very nice compliment. Hiya, Rosie, he said. <laughs> I can't stand you on the screen, but you're certainly sweetness and light around here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's... That's quite a tribute to your acting, Betty. <laughs> Have you picked a play for next week yet, Mr. DeMille? Yes. And it's a roaring drama of the West. Republic's current screen hit in old Oklahoma. And our stars will be Roy Rogers, Martha Scott, and Albert Decker. It's the story of a, of a girl and a cowboy who discover romance as well as oil in the rich land of Oklahoma. And besides a thrilling drama, we'll also have the songs of Hollywood's great cowboy star, Roy Rogers. Very exciting evening, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Any theater should be thankful for players like you three. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Martha Scott, Roy Rogers, and Albert Decker in In Old Oklahoma. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This week, all America salutes those women who are working in war useful jobs. Women must get into the war with their hands as well as their hearts until victory is finally won. Betty Davis has just finished the picture Mrs. Skeffington at Warner Brothers and is currently seen in Old Acquaintance. Herbert Marshall appeared through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Vincent Price is currently seen in the 20th Century Fox picture The Song of Bernadette. The Warner Brothers screenplay of the letter was written by Howard Koch. Heard in tonight's play were Charlie Lung as Ong Chi, B. Benaderet as Chinese Woman, Richard Davis as Withers, and Frederick Warlock, Alex Havier, Regina Wallace, Paula Winslow, Joe Gilbert, Eric Snowden, and Charles Seal. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Martha Scott, Roy Rogers, and Albert Decker in the play In Old Oklahoma. Listen, everybody. Free vitamins for you and every member of your family. Your druggist will hand you a regular 50-cent package of famous Vims free with every large economy-sized Vims you buy. A two dollar and a quarter value for one sixty nine. Remember, Vims are vitamin complete. Have vitally needed minerals too. Complete satisfaction with Vims or your money back. The offer is limited, so hurry to your druggist. Don't wait. Get your free Vims. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.